Welcome to worship today at Western Boulevard Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to have you with us today, especially if you're visiting with us. We welcome you and hope you find in this time of worship an encounter with the living, loving God. If you're visiting with us today, or all of us, I would invite us to sign the fellowship pads. You'll find those along the center aisle of your pew. Uh, it's a wonderful way for you to greet one another by name following the service. Today we are blessed and grateful to have uh, Susan Crabiel as our guest preacher today. Susan led a workshop yesterday for our presbytery uh, on building bridges for churches to seek uh, how to welcome asylum seekers and ways to network and share in that work. And Susan is an associate for the migration uh, accompaniment ministries of our Presbyterian Disaster Assistance at a, as a part of our denomination. So, Susan, we welcome you. We're grateful for you bringing the word today and for being here this weekend. You'll see in your purple insert, uh, there are a lot of things happening in our church's life. So let me just mention some things quickly so that you can consider how you might participate in them. Uh, Wednesday Night Live will be this, this Wednesday, and it's uh, Bring Your Own Casserole Night. Uh, it's a casserole cook-off. So be sure to pull those recipes out, bring those in, use the RSVP to share with us who's coming, and we're grateful for everyone uh, to share in their recipes. The other thing is on, two, uh, on Halloween night, you'll see an announcement about what we're planning to do with Trunk or Treat and Eats. Uh, so we're going to have our normal pizza party that we offer for folks at 530. But then we're also inviting folks to, bring, to have their cars and come in the parking lot and do Trunk or Treat. And you'll see details about that and how you can RSVP for that uh, in the bulletin. Also, we have a time coming up later in October, in the beginning of November, where we'll be hosting, uh, providing meals for the Family Promise families. Uh, you'll see ways you can sh share in that and lead that in the, in the bulletin. And then finally, this Saturday, October 21st, we have a great opportunity again uh, for families of, or, and people of all ages to, for serving in the city uh, related to working with Family Promise. You'll see details about that. It starts at noon here at the church. And then they'll be going uh, later to, at 115 over to Family Promise at the Day Center. And if you have any questions, you can talk to Becky Burmester, and she'll be happy to share any details that you might make. Um, let me mention a couple of things about our service. Uh, our psalm today will be Psalm 121, and we're going to be singing hymn 45 when we do that, and we'll remain seated as we sing. And then also, um, for our closing hymn, you'll see a white insert in your bulletin. That is what we'll be using for our closing hymn. Uh, it's written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. It's actually, <laughs> we actually get to use it before it's been fully published yet. Um, and it's a, all of the materials today, liturgical materials, come from our Presbyterian Disaster Assistance resources related to migration and worship resources that they have offered. And so we're grateful for that. And that's one of those resources that we're sharing. Let's continue our worship. I'll invite Millie to come and lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us stand to worship God. Give thanks to the Lord, whose steadfast love endures forever. We are strangers before you and sojourners like all our ancestors. God is our rock and our refuge, a strong 
and mighty fortress. We are strangers before you and sojourners like all our ancestors. Beloved, people of light, come. The Lord is our hope. God welcomes us all, whoever we are, wherever we are, however we are. God welcomes us all. come before the throne of God, the mercy seat with all of our humanity, open to the peace of promised forgiveness. Let us pray. God of grace, we confess that we are too concerned with our own peace. We seek the comfort of silence and ignore the cries of the oppressed. We are, we are on focused, missing, missing your call to serve the world in justice. Forgive, forgive us, O oh God. Forgive, forgive us for the times we only recognize image in those who look, think, and act like us. Forgive, forgive us for the times we forget your blessings and acted as if the poor, the hungry, and the first as someone brought their reality upon themselves. Equip us to fulfill your world for a world in which we all know dignity and all are created with equity as you are our children. Amen. Hear the good news. 
whoever we are, wherever we are, however we are, we help, we belting to God, we belong to God, excuse me. Through Jesus Christ, God cleanses us from our selfishness and individualism, leading us to wholeness and community. People of God, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As the Lord has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another, sharing the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. be seated. I would like to invite the children to come up and join me for a couple minutes together. Come on up. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Here they come. They're moving a little slowly today. That's okay. Come on up. Oh, look at those boots. Woo! Sparkly. Love it. Hey, how's it going? It's good to see you guys. How are you? So I wanted to ask you something. Do you all ever have guests who come maybe to stay with you or to come to your house to visit, like maybe family or friends or people? Does that happen sometimes? What do we do when people come and are going to stay with us? What are some things we do to get ready for them? We clean up, don't we? Yeah. And we do that at our house, too. Don't worry. What else might we do? Prepare some food. Yeah, maybe cook some meals or cook some things. Get ready to, to feed them. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Gets maybe have some activities, things to do, things that we can do together. Like if someone's coming from out of town, maybe go visit and do some things. Yeah, anything else? That's, those are great. Those are all things that I think we think about when we're... Uh, when folks are coming and who are guests who are going to be, be with us, maybe clean up your bed. Yeah. Maybe, maybe change the sheets. Maybe uh, vacuum. Maybe make sure, yeah, everything looks and smells. It want people to feel welcome, don't we, when they come to our house. I, I ask all of that because yesterday there were a number of us who were gathered here at the church to talk about a lot of guests who are here in our country, but they've come from other countries and they've come under circumstances that are very difficult. They've had to leave their home countries because of violence, because of war, because they don't have enough to eat or feed their families. And they're coming here looking for hope, for a new life. And our group was talking about ways we can work to support them and provide some of the same things you all mentioned, but even more so, just be there with them through that. Maybe to help them if they have a question like at, uh, with a legal issue, or maybe to help them find a doctor, or to help them with transportation. Those are all ways that we're, we think about what does it mean to welcome others in the name of Jesus, because God has shown us God's love through Jesus. And who knows? 
Maybe in your schools, maybe in your neighborhoods, you have some friends or classmates who are in that situation. And maybe that's a way for us to always have our eyes open to how God wants us to welcome and make others feel welcome as well. Okay? Thanks for letting me share that with you. Let's say a prayer together. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks that you welcome all of us into your, lo into your love and how we are called to share that love with others who are guests here who are in need of so many things. We pray that our eyes and hearts and minds might be open to share everything you have given us to others so that they might know the love you share with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The congregation says... What do we say? There we go. For those who want to do children's chapel, I see Miss Ebby and Miss Mel at the back, and others of you can go sit with your families, okay? Have a great week. Uh. <laughs> Prayer for illumination. Your word, O oh God, is a feast all its own. Let your Holy Spirit open our minds to your call to listen. For we know your holy word heals and reconciles your people. Amen. The scripture reading is from the Old, the Old Testament scripture reading. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 14, reading from verse, I mean from verse 22 to 29. Set apart a tithe of all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field. In the presence of the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose as a dwelling for his name, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the firstlings of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to fear the, word, the Lord your God always. But if when the Lord your God has blessed you, the distance is so great, that you are unable to transport it because the place where the Lord your God will choose to set his name is too far from you. Then you may turn it into money. When the money secure in hand, go to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Spend the money for whatever you wish, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, or whatever you desire. And you shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your household rejoicing together. As for the Levites, residents in your towns, do not neglect them, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you. Every third year, you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the residents' aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns, may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. Sorry. Every third year, oh, excuse me, that you undertake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I thought I had some more. <laughs>
Good morning. We continue with our second reading today from Ephesians. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us, abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. So it's good to be with you here this morning. Thank you to Reverend Mansell, to the oh, excuse me, the members of the congregation, um, for all the ways you've hosted us, uh, me personally, this weekend. Special shout out to Sandy and Dean for their gracious hosting of me in their home. Uh, let's take a moment, please, and pray with me. Gracious God, as we continue this time of worship together, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And may we hear what new word you have for all of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So you might wonder a little bit about the passages I chose today for talking about refugees and asylum seekers. Little did I know when I picked them out what would soon be taking place in Israel and Gaza, adding to the violence, death, and destruction in a world already filled with too much of it. I was thinking about this season of peacemaking that we just completed in the Presbyterian Church USA and this past Monday's holiday known in some places as Columbus Day, in others as Indigenous Peoples Day. Even before this newest war began, the world was facing the largest recorded number of people who have felt forced to leave their homes due to war, oppression, persecution, natural and human-caused disasters, and other forms of violence. And what happens to them when they do leave? What happens to them when they find a new place where they hope to be safe, where they hope to set down their roots. In today's passage from Ephesians, this letter to the early church in Ephesus, there was much division. Paul is aware of the arguments going on that are pulling apart this community, and he addresses it head on. He starts by pleading with them, reminding these church members where they came from. You, who were Gentiles, 
Remember? You were the outsiders, the excluded, deemed unclean. Don't you remember, Paul says? You were once the ones considered other and unworthy. In Paul's letter, I hear the echo of Hebrew scripture, remember you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, reminding us that we also have times when we were othered and pushed away. Now, most of us are familiar with this situation in the church in Ephesus. We've heard about this argument going on in the early church, the division between those who became Christians through Judaism and those who became Christians who were Gentiles, believers of other religions. And now there's this power struggle going on in the church about the right way to be Christian. Who is that real Christian? So Paul pleads with them to stop the fighting, and then he lays out this beautiful vision. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. Through Christ, that which separated the Jew and the Gentile is gone. The dividing wall between insiders and outsiders has been broken down. And Paul continues with these images of moving from separation into unity. One humanity in the place of two, reconciled into one body, that Christ came to proclaim peace to those who are far away and those who are near. No longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. How many different ways can Paul make his point? Can you hear his voice sort of rising as he writes each subsequent phrase, culminating in this image of a temple, a dwelling place for God in which the whole structure is held together by Jesus Christ? A body, a new humanity, a nation, a temple, called to belong to each other as connected as stones and mortar, as sinew and bone. Now I know that Paul was not thinking about global migration when he wrote this letter to Ephesus, and certainly not about US immigration policy. And yet when I look at the arc of scripture as a whole, I do believe that this message from Paul does apply to our communities in which we live and has something to say about how we live in this divided world. And that brings me to the second scripture this morning, Deuteronomy. The Hebrew laws are filled with statements about how we are to treat one another, with frequent message about how to treat widows, orphans, and foreigners. Now, I'm careful about quoting the laws because there are a lot of them I'm not really willing to follow, such as not eating pork or seafood or mixing my meat and cheese together or wearing clothes of mixed fiber like I am this morning. Not all laws make sense to be in place forever. In fact, the Hebrews seem to know this. In fact, in the Hebrew scriptures, we learn about the practice of Jubilee, a time every so often when a community stops and takes note of who makes up the community, and they make adjustments. You take time to note the, pact of, the impact of migration, of deaths, of illnesses, who's been widowed, who's been orphaned, who is the outsider residing among you, and you make sure that they are cared for and you care for each other. The Jubilee recommends things as radical as forgiving debts, as redistributing land and other property, taking care of those who are vulnerable and be, have become a part of your community. It is in this context that we hear the commandment about tithes. Now, I find the first part of this passage quite intriguing. I don't know that I'd ever paid much attention to it before preparing for today's sermon. You're to take your tithe to that place that God directs you. In one translation, it says, to that place of worship, so that you can eat the fruits of your labor, the wheat, the oil, the wine, from your herds and your flock. And it goes to say that if the place God has chosen is too far away, you can actually sell all of that, take the money, spend it as you like, eat and rejoice. 
It's a party. It's a celebration. When we do offerings here in church, at Presbyterian Church particularly, it often feels kind of solemn. Here is a sharing of their ties in joy and, and in celebration. And the text goes on to say, and don't forget the Levites, those priests, for they don't have their own source of income. So be sure to include them. And then this part, every third year, you are to take the full tithe and bring it into the town to store there. Then the priests, the Levites, the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. Aliens, orphans, widows. This is not just a random list of people. These are outsiders because of the laws and customs of the times. The orphans, the widows, and aliens have no access to land ownership. They are landless in an economy that depends upon the land for survival. I became interested in this Deuteronomy passage because of a conversation at the U.S.-Mexico border a few years ago when a member of the group made the observation that every Sunday we talk about bringing in our offerings. And when we do, we acknowledge that what we give is out of what we have received from God. That in our offering, we are tithing and returning to God a portion of what belongs to God. And she said, and yet, when we think about our land and we think about our borders, most Americans who are not indigenous are quick to claim our ownership. We hold tightly onto our land titles and our property. And it made us wonder how would our view of immigration change if we thought of our lands, our countries, as something we hold lightly in stewardship, as land that belongs to God. Now, Presbyterian Church USA policy is very clear. The U.S. government has the right to control and defend our borders. So please hear me when I am not advocating here for open borders. And yet I do wonder how this passage about tithing and thinking about the way our lands are held might shift us in the way we think about newcomers who come to our soil. Human history is a history of human mobility. People have been on the move since they roamed the Serengeti, since Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden. The Deuteronomy passage and much of Hebrew scriptures take migration as normal. For as long as humans have existed, they have been on the move, sometimes searching for better food and land, sometimes fleeing outside aggression to escape slavery or to follow God's call towards something new. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. And the Levites, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. They're connected, right? Blessing you in all the work you undertake. So much of today's anti-immigrant discourse is about fear and scarcity. They are coming to take what is ours. And because we don't have enough, we have to stop them from coming. How does this view of immigration inform the way immigrants are treated that live in our communities? How does this attitude that they don't belong here become a justification to treat them badly with distrust and suspicion, not deserving of the same treatment as the rest of us? How does this view of immigrants allow us to pay lower wages, keep them on a short leash with one-year employment permits or ICE immigration check-ins? How does it consciously and unconsciously inform the way we think about immigrants and asylum seekers? Does this view of immigration as a bad thing lead to the attitude that newcomers should be grateful for any scraps that fall from the table, that whatever they get is more than they deserve? I think Deuteronomy and Ephesians offer a different perspective. Bringing in the tithes with a party, a generous spirit, a sharing with the whole community, natural part of the, of the existence. 
Paul's vision of a whole community where barriers that divide us are gone, where we no longer see our differences as reasons to separate us, but to make up one community, no longer strangers and aliens, but all citizens, part of one body, part of one temple. Yesterday, as you already heard in this church, we had about 30 people gathered who took seriously these calls to share our resources with our new neighbors. Building Bridges of Welcome brought together people from various churches, immigrant communities, refugee and immigrant serving organizations, and even a local government representative. The purpose of the gathering was to identify and imagine how our resources could be used in new ways and with deeper relationships to create a community that is inclusive of all newcomers and asylum seekers. We heard firsthand the struggles of immigrants who felt rejection and suspicion from people they met. We learned about the ways they themselves shared from their meager wages any means they could to help those who have come more recently. And they challenged us in the churches and local government not to waste our resources, not to leave them unused. Bring in your tithes, share the resources you have. It is a joyous occasion. We were reminded that you don't have to go to the border to meet immigrants. They're cleaning your houses and offices. They're mowing your lawns. Some of you may be familiar with the title of today's sermon, Yours, Mine, and Ours. It comes from a Lucille Ball movie many years ago, precursor to the Brady Bunch, about two families where the parents were trying to find a way to move from yours, mine, into an ours. The border wall is not the only wall that divides us. Where are the dividing walls that perhaps we don't see right here in Raleigh that we need to be broken down? I am so grateful for the faith of those who gathered yesterday and grateful for being with you today here. And may God's grace help us all to see a glimpse of Paul's vision where we may know that we are all citizens of one house, one body, one temple for God's glory. May it be so.
Let's remain standing and affirm our faith using the words from a brief statement of faith, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. Let us say together what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to a time when we lift up our prayers for ourselves and for others. And before I get into those joys and concerns, I'm going to call on Larry Shelton and Ollie Milchuk. They have a, um, a very special joy and concern to share. <clears throat> you got it. Well, all the pennies have been counted. <laughs> uh, the Penny Wars was a, was a big success, so I take great joy in that. We raised uh, $723.98. And that's about all I got to say. <laughs> okay, so NC State. Um, well, I do want to say one thing. Uh, if any of y'all don't remember how it works, if you put pennies in the state jar, that was a positive number. If you put any other type of money, checks, debit cards, whatever in there, that was a negative number. So the game was the one with the less negative number wins. Just wanted to be sure, y'all. So speaking of that, NC State uh, altogether donated $498.64, which comes out to $48,946 points. Minus that. Minus that. Minus? That's minus, how many was taken away? Minus 48946 Okay. UNC put up $224.34, but only lost 21 a uh, thousand points, four hundred and fifty-six, Correct. which makes UNC the winner of the Penny Wars. And, and if I can speak to, for all of our state brethren, we're finally glad to see y'all are pulling your weight now. <laughs> That's why I said it was both a joy and a concern. Um, <laughs> Many thanks to all of you for your deep generosity to the youth uh, for helping raise money. I have a feeling there might be a round two at some point uh, coming up. Uh, let me, speaking to some joys and concerns that I'm aware of, I'll share those and then I'll invite you, if you have one, to raise your hand and we'll be, be happy to bring the microphone to you so that you might share it as well. Let me start with a couple of joys that I'm aware of. One is that I, I wanted to share a joy that today uh, begins our confirmation class here at Western Boulevard Presbyterian. We have nine students who will be participating and alongside them will be nine adult mentors uh, walking along this journey. So we're grateful for all of them uh, beginning this, this journey together and we'll keep you posted as they learn and grow and what they have to share on that journey. And I wanna share real quick, Edna Earl, where's Edna Earl? Raise your hand. She has a joy to share and that is that she is a great grandmother today. Um, her son and her son David's a grandfather, which is also hard to believe. Uh, but baby was born, baby boy was born on uh, October 11th, and so we celebrate with them, and all are doing well. So we give thanks for that. Let me share a couple of concerns uh, to, to lift up. One is in our congregation today, we give thanks for the life of Margaret Pittman. Uh, Miss Margaret died on Tuesday at the age of 97 years old. 
um, and lived a long and, and wonderful life in service to, to, to our God. Um, a service, a graveside service, will be held this Friday, um, October 20th at 2 o'clock p.m. at Montlawn Cemetery. Um, we shared the obituary through our email, our prayer chain yesterday, and it was also, I believe, uh, in the Raleigh News and Observer uh, here over the weekend. So our prayers surround Bobby and Bev and, of course, Ronnie and all of their family as they grieve uh, Margaret's death. We continue to remember Mac Winslow's father, uh, Jim, he suffered a stroke uh, this past week, and after being hospitalized, is back home now recovering. So our prayers are with him. Uh, we remember Mason Moore. Um, good news, I shared last weekend, uh, last Sunday, that he had to have a surgical procedure. It was actually a blood patch surgery. And following that, that has relieved a good deal of the pain that he was experiencing. So we give thanks to God for that, but continue to lift Mason up in our prayers for his continued treatment. And we lift up today as well the people of Afghanistan. Uh, over a week ago, they suffered a horrible earthquake that killed over a thousand people. And then I heard on the radio today, another earthquake has hit the similar region of that country. And so our prayers are with those people as they navigate and, and, and get their lives back together following that. Are there others whom you would mention that we might be aware of them as a community of faith? And I will, I'll be sharing that in my prayers today. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say how happy I am to have found a church that is so um, understanding of others. My sons are Palestinian, and last week I didn't come to church because I was afraid of what would have happened, <laughs> um, if, so the, what I would hear. I know it's, it's, not, it's not right, but I was a little afraid. But I watched the uh, sermon online late, later, and um, and, I got the feeling that um, that this is a place where I can come and I can feel comfortable attending and being with the, being in fellowship with these people because um, they really have the love of God and it's love and and uh, no judgment for people who are different. So that's very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. And we we obviously lift up in our prayers what. All of the people of the Middle East, uh, especially in Israel and, and the Gaza Strip and Palestine, and what is happening there. And I'll be sharing some specific prayers for that in our prayers today. Are there others? Yeah. Yes, Susan. Update on and the yeah, we, if folks had not heard that earlier, um, we had another up, I mean, Shedlin in Haiti, um, because of gang violence and, and coming, they, he had to take the children uh, away from the school and the church where they are and actually walk up to 15 miles to find a safe house in Haiti um, where they are now safe, but they, have, they, are, they are no longer on campus. They've had, no, they have a house. and they have a, a guest house where they are staying now, but as we, and it's very hard with communication right now as well. So as, as we're able to find more, uh, Kathy Johnson and others and Susan and others, if we hear, we'll be sure to share those through our communication network. But please hold Shedlin and, and the people of Haiti in our prayers today. The prayers which I'm going to share today, um, our, our words are shared uh, from two different folks. One is from Terry Ott and one is from Emily Wilkes, both of whom um, offer these prayers, both for those um, who are migrants and immigrants and then also for the war in Israel and, and Gaza. Let us turn to God in prayer. God of movement, we remember that the stories of our tradition are stories of wandering, of flight, or forced migration. Our holy scriptures tell us of the sojourns of the people of God, of slavery and persecution, of wandering in the wilderness, of exile and loss. May we who are the body of Christ, the church, embrace and welcome all who seek shelter from any danger. We thank you that love overcomes fear, that in your compassion we learn to walk with those who suffer, that when we give of ourselves, we receive far more. 
and that when we receive those who stand knocking at our doors, we receive Christ, the Beloved One. Eternal God, you know our history of complicated conflicts, tense polarization, and situations so politicized that we are afraid to say or pray anything. Yet we know you grieve the violence of war and condemn acts of terrorism. We know you grieve the historical suffering of Jews and Palestinians. May our prayers for peace be uttered out loud for all to hear. Our prayers for diplomacy and for difficult yet faithful conversation to resume. God, we groan in grief over the news of this war in Israel and Gaza. Pave a path toward peace in this age-old, tragic conflict. Protect the innocent wherever bombs of destruction fall. Be with those who are captured and the families of those who are captured. Offer a way out for those who are trapped. Awaken us to our common humanity, our common human needs, no matter the walls that we build. Merciful Lord, hear now our prayers for others that we have named out loud and others who come to our hearts and minds in a time of silence. We ask all of these things in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught his disciples how to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'd like to invite Andrew Craven to come forward um, and share with us uh, a brief sharing on stewardship. Um, as he's coming forward, I would remind you, you'll see in your purple insert, that stewardship materials went out this week. If you did not receive any yet, you'll find them. There's some uh, brochure and pledge cards are on the table in the narthex. And also, we will be having a special Wednesday night live on October 25th. Mr. Orlando Carr from the Presbyterian Foundation will be our guest speaker that evening. And we'll be having a special meal and, and a time to also share about our hopes and dreams for what God is calling us to do in 2024. So if you would, be sure to reserve uh, RSVP for that. We hope many, many of you will be able to come. And we look forward to welcoming Mr. Carr and learning and hearing from him on stewardship. I appreciate Andrew being here today. Andrew. Good morning. Good morning. Frank asked me to come up and drive some soul. All of you state fans, I know it's been a rough 24 hours. No, I'm sorry, this is stewardship campaign. I apologize for that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Craven. I'm chair of the Personnel Administration Committee. And uh, as part of the stewardship campaign, I wanted to share a little bit about what we do and, and how we do it. Um, personnel Administration Committee oversees various aspects of supporting our, our staff, including payroll and benefits as well as day-to-day -day office needs of the church, such as telecom web services, office equipment, all very exciting stuff, but mainly <laughs> supporting our, our head of staff, uh, Frank, in his endeavors and uh, uh, keeping us afloat. Our goal is to make the best use of the budget allotted so that we can bring qualified individuals to serve here at Western Boulevard and to manage services that allow us to operate as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, finding new ways to attract and retain employees guides our mission as a committee. Uh, over the last two years, we have made great strides uh, to, to support our staff by offering benefits to eligible employees. We've 
made several new hires, including Justin, by a special committee, uh, our administrative assistant, Emily. Uh, been a busy, busy little stretch. Uh, we've been creating new roles to better serve the church, the most ex significant one being the transition from the associate pastor to the newly created role of the director of Christian education, who we're fortunate to have Courtney in is that role right now. Uh, the other being the social media coordinator, Quintessa, who was our former administrative assistant, who now handles that and is doing a great job keeping everybody abreast until we get the website revamped. But anyway, that's another subject altogether. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> suiting the roles to serve the needs requires constant adaptation and, and fine tuning. Uh, the financial impacts of these changes are at the forefront of the committee's con concern. Like all committees, we have to stay within the existing framework of the budget. Inflationary increases are ever present and the addition of benefits to positions has added, added to our bottom line. It's a necessary step so that we remain competitive and are able to fill key roles effectively. So on behalf of the Personnel Administration Committee, and I don't think I introduced all the members, I skipped that part, it's myself, it's Jenny Fleming, it's Blythe Clifford, uh, Kate Tremble, and sometimes Larry Sheldon. Um, so on behalf of all of us, we're extremely grateful for the resources the, the congregation provides for us fulfilling our mission. We will continue to try and make decisions that positively impact the daily life and long-term mission of Western Boulevard Presbyterian. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let us turn back to God now, offering our lives and the gifts which we bring this day. Loving and gracious God, you are our provider. We, prov you, we offer all that we have and all that we are to you because we belong to you. Bless these gifts and empower us, your church, 
that through the work of your Spirit we may be a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May we see bright in the vision of days when war shall cease, when hatred and division give way to love and peace. Where others see walls, may we see tables. Where others see despair, may we see hope. And may the grace of God our Father go with you and be with you today and every day. Go in peace. <laughs>